Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Eugenius. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short pause. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Doctor, he is my son, Eugenius. A few hours ago, he fell off his bicycle. He was not wearing a helmet. He went unconscious for a few seconds. He complains of neck pain now. Does he have any other illness? No, doctor. Okay, what's his age? Twelve years, doctor. Any previous injuries? Very minor injuries. Doctor. Was he taking any medicines? No, doctor. Does he smoke or drink? No, doctor. Can you tell me more about family history of illness? Absolutely no illness in our family, doctor. Any weight loss or gain recently? No, doctor. Well, his physical examination shows his blood pressure 150 over 75, pulse rate 80, respirations 18, temperature 37.4, Saturation 97% on room air. He is moderately obese. His neck is symmetric. The trachea is in the midline, and there are no masses. No crepitus is palpated. The thyroid is palpable, not enlarged, smooth, moves with swallowing, and has no palpable masses. Normal respiratory effort. There is no intercostal retraction or action by the accessory muscles. Normal breath sounds bilaterally with no ronchi, wheezing, or rubs. The point of maximal impulse is palpable at the 5 ICS in the MCL. No thrills on palpitation. S1 and S2 are easily audible. No audible S3, S4, murmur, click, or rub. Abdominal aorta is not palpable. No audible abdominal brutes. Femoral pulses are 3 plus bilaterally without audible brutes. Extremities show no edema or varicosities. Gastrointestinal investigation shows no palpable tenderness or masses. Liver and spleen are percussed, but not palpable under the costal margins. No evidence for umbilical or groin hernia. No lymphatic nodes over 3 mm in the neck, axillae, or groins. Musculoskeletal test shows normal gait and station, symmetric muscle strength and normal tone without signs of atrophy or abnormal movements. There is a hematoma in the forehead and one in the occipital scalp, and there are abrasions in the upper extremities and abrasions on the knees. No induration or subcutaneous nodules to palpitation. I have reviewed his chest x-ray and it is normal. Right hand x-ray, which is normal, and an MRI of the head, which is also normal. He has concussion, facial abrasion, scalp laceration, and knee abrasions. Admit him today and his health condition will be monitored by our team. We have observation team working 24 hours. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Gregorius. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short pause. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Yes, come in. What's your problem? Well, he is my husband. 
and he had a markedly abnormal stress test with severe chest pain after five minutes of exercise on the standard Bruce with horizontal ST depressions and moderate apical ischemia on stress imaging only. What's his name? He is Mr. Gregorius. What is his age? 55, doctor. Well, his cardiac catheterization today shows mild to moderate left main distal disease of 30%, moderate proximal left anterior descending coronary artery with a severe mid-left anterior descending coronary artery lesion of 99%, and a mid-left circumflex lesion of 80% with normal left ventricle function and some mild luminal irregularities in the right coronary artery with some moderate stenosis seen in the mid to distal right patent ductus arteriosus. He shows rest anginal symptoms, as well as nocturnal angina symptoms, and especially given the severity of the mid-left anterior descending lesion with a markedly abnormal stress test. I am prescribing him aspirin 325 mg once a day, Nexium 40 mg once a day, Zocor 40 mg once a day, Plavix 600 mg, which I am giving him tonight. I would suggest that you transfer him for percutaneous coronary intervention. That is the end of Part A. Now, look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about gallstones. Now read the question. Gallstones are formed due to an imbalance in the composition of bile, resulting in hard stones that are made of pigment or crystallized cholesterol, or a mixture of the two. They can range in size from as small as a sand grain to as large as a tennis ball. One can have a single large gallstone, dozens to hundreds of smaller gallstones, or a combination of both small and large stones. There are two types of gallstones. Typically, patients with pigment stones have cirrhosis of the liver, biliary tract infections, and hereditary blood disorders, including sickle cell anemia. These are all conditions that produce too much bilirubin, of which the stones are made of. Pigment stones tend to be dark brown or black. Cholesterol stones are formed as a result of bile that is made of too much cholesterol or bilirubin and not enough bile salts. They can also form when the gallbladder fails to empty during the digestive process. They are usually yellow-green gallstones, which are the most common type. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on Crohn's disease. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of Crohn's diseases? Well, Crohn's disease is a chronic, incurable disease that can cause inflammation anywhere along the digestive tract. Crohn's disease is characterized by symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, cramping, weight loss, bloating, and blood in stools. Crohn's disease affects people differently, mainly due to the different types of the disease and the areas they affect. The most common types of Crohn's disease are ileocolitis that affects the colon and adjacent ileum, jejunalitis affects the jejunum, Iliitis affects the ileum, Crohn's granulomatous affects the colon, gastroduodenal Crohn's disease affects the stomach and adjacent duodenum. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on diagnosis methods for endometrial cancer and its stages. Now read the question.
Hello, doctor. What are the methods of diagnosing endometrial cancer and its stages? Endometrial cancer is the main type of uterine cancer, starts in the cells that make up the endometrium, and then shed each month during menstruation. The cancer is only in the uterus during stage 1. During the stage 2, the cancer is in cervix and uterus. The cancer spreads beyond uterus within the pelvic area during stage 3. And during stage 4, the cancer has spread outside the pelvic area to bladder, rectum, or other parts. The diagnosis for endometrial cancer include a computerized tomography scan, chest x-ray, positron emission tomography scan, and blood tests. The results of these diagnoses will determine the cancer stage. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on types of hemorrhoids and their effects. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the types of hemorrhoids and their effects? Well, hemorrhoids are a common but aggravating condition involving inflamed and swollen veins in the rectum or anus. Often, external hemorrhoids are identified by a lump on the surface of the anus. These tend to be the most uncomfortable because they are nerve endings in the area. Anal pain, itchiness, tenderness when wiping are some of the symptoms. The pain can become especially severe if the hemorrhoid clots. Typically, internal hemorrhoids are painless and undetected with no visible signs. Pain can occur if the hemorrhoid begins to prolapse out of the anal canal, though this is rare. If the hemorrhoid becomes fixed outside of the anal canal, the pain can often be excruciating, especially if thrombosed. On rare occasion, such hemorrhoids will require emergency care. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on different categories of chemotherapy drugs. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different categories of chemotherapy drugs? There are several types of chemotherapy drugs that vary both in their functioning and on which part of the cell cycle they work. Alkylating agents are nonspecific drugs that directly damage DNA. Examples include cytoxin and myloran. Antimetabolites work by pretending they are nutritional sources for the cell. Cancer cells take up these drugs instead of nutrients and essentially starve to death. Examples include navelbine, VP16, and Gemzar. Plant alkaloids include drugs obtained from plant sources. Examples include cosmogen and mutamycin. Anti-tumor antibiotics differ from the types of antibiotics used to treat bacterial infections. These drugs work by preventing cancer cells from reproducing. Examples include adriamycin and cerubidine. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a doctor on different types of anemia. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of anemia? Anemia results from a decreased number of red blood cells, or hemoglobin, the protein that carries oxygen. Anemia can result from iron deficiency, sickle cell disease, or thalassemia. Neutropenia is a decreased number of neutrophils, a type of white blood cell, which are an essential part of our immune system that fights off bacterial infections. There are numerous causes, including autoimmune neutropenia, Swachman Diamond Syndrome, and cyclic neutropenia. Polycythemia vera is a condition in which our bone marrow makes an excessive number of red blood cells. This increase can elevate your risk of clot formation. Immune thrombocytopenic purpura is a condition in which the platelets are marked as foreign and are therefore destroyed. This can lead to very low platelet counts and bleeding. Thrombocytosis is a condition caused by an increased number of platelets. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C.
Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic white blood cell disorders. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. White blood cells are predominantly involved in fighting infections and participating in inflammatory reactions, while red blood cells carry oxygen to the body. Platelets help stop bleeding. The normal number of white blood cell ranges from around 4 to 11 billion cells per liter. Newborn babies have a higher range, from around 9 to 30 billion cells per liter, which goes down over the first two years of life and is similar to adult normal ranges for the rest of childhood. Opposed to red blood cells, the normal range is not affected by gender. However, it is affected by race. In national studies, African Americans have lower baseline white blood cell counts than Caucasians. There are several different ways to categorize white blood cell disorders. First, they can be categorized by cause, those that affect white blood cell production and other factors that affect the function of the white blood cell. Secondly, white blood cell disorders might be categorized by which type of white blood cell is affected. In some disorders, all the white blood cells are affected, but others only affect one type. There are five major types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, which predominantly fight bacterial infections. Lymphocytes, which predominantly fight viral infections. Monocytes, which predominantly fight fungal infections. Eosinophils, which predominantly fight parasitic infections and are involved in allergic reactions. And basophils, which are involved in inflammatory reactions. Thirdly, white blood cell disorders can be classified as benign or malignant. The majority of white blood cell disorders are benign. Generally, too much of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with philia on the end of the word, and too few of one type of white blood cell is suffixed with penia, which is applicable to all types of white blood cells. For instance, leukophilia is a white blood cell count above the normal range, and leukopenia is a white blood cell count below the normal range. These can also be applied scientific white blood cells, such as neutropenia, with too few neutrophils, or basophilia, with too many basophils. Leukophilia is an increased number of white blood cells. The most common causes are infection, medications like prednisone. Autoimmune neutropenia occurs when the body secretes antibodies that attack and destroy neutrophils. Patients with severe congenital neutropenia are born with severe neutropenia secondary to genetic mutation and have recurrent bacterial infections. Cyclic neutropenia is caused due to genetic mutation similar to severe congenital neutropenia. However, the neutropenia does not occur every day but in cycles of about 21 days. Leukemia is a cancerous white blood cells produced in the bone marrow. Chronic granulomatous disease is a disorder where multiple types of white blood cells become unable to function properly. It is an inherited condition and results in multiple infections, particularly pneumonia and abscesses. Leukocyte adhesion deficiency is a disorder where the white blood cells are unable to move areas of infection.
Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. The two main categories of lymphoma are Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a large group of diseases with different symptoms, treatments, and outcomes. The appropriate name of the type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma may include a number of descriptive terms that can be difficult to understand. Lymphomas arise from lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell, which are of two types, T cells and B cells. Both help in killing infectious agents, however, in slightly different ways. Based on the type of lymphocyte turned into the cancer cell, the patients may have a T-cell or a B-cell lymphoma. B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the more common type. There are many different types of B-cell and T-cell lymphomas, each behaving in a different way. Pathologists performing biopsy of the tumor define the cancers in terms of grade. High-grade lymphoma cells look quite different from normal cells. They tend to grow aggressively. Low-grade lymphomas have cells that look much more similar to normal cells and multiply gradually. Intermediate-grade lymphomas fall somewhere in the middle. The behavior of these types is also described as indolent and aggressive. What the pathologist describes as a high-grade or intermediate-grade lymphoma usually grows fast in the body, so these two types are considered aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Surprisingly, aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma often responds better to treatment, and many people with aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma are cured if they are diagnosed early. The most common kind of aggressive lymphoma is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. On the other hand, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma grows gradually, and these lymphomas are therefore called indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This group of non-Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't give rise to too many symptoms, but they are also long-standing and are less likely to be cured. The most common kind of indolent lymphoma is follicular lymphoma. At times, indolent lymphomas can transform into more aggressive. The majority of lymphomas are nodal lymphomas. That means they originate in the lymph nodes. However, it is possible for lymphomas to arise from anywhere else. When the lymphoma is mainly present in nodes, it is called nodal disease. Occasionally, most of the lymphoma may be in an organ that is not a part of the lymph system, such as the skin, the stomach, or the brain. In such condition, the lymphoma is referred to as extranodal. Therefore, nodal and extranodal refer to the primary site of the disease. A lymphoma can develop in a lymph node and then involve other parts at a later stage. However, in such a case, it is still considered a nodal lymphoma, but is said to have extranodal involvement. In follicular lymphoma, the cancer cells arrange themselves in spherical clusters called follicles. In diffuse non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the cells are spread around without any clustering. Most of the time, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks follicular, and intermediate or high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks diffuse in biopsy. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas are also described as common or rarer based on the statistics of the new cases every year. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.